something I shared on, um, it was really this week, I touched on it a couple of times, is that we had a prayer service. Actually, we actually had four prayer services here through the week. We were praying uh, Monday through Thursday at 12 o'clock for the people of Ukraine. Thank you for those of you who came out and you prayed, you know, for the people um, and for the Lord to bless them and to help them, to give them everything that they need, and also to pray for the Russian people and to pray for a change in leadership in Russia. So it was a really, really, I thought, um, very intense, but also praise honoring time of God as we were grouping and praying together. And one of the things that I really felt led to share um, in those days was, was that the Lord kind of took me to Second Chronicles chapter 20, where in the story there, what had taken place was there's a king, a faithful king by the name of Jehoshaphat. There were armies coming against him, and it looked like they were done, um, that they had no chance. And so, I mean, mathematically, they were outnumbered. Um, but, but basically what happened was the Lord said he was going to give victory, and so they put the singers at the front of the line as they were going into battle, and as they went singing and worshiping God, at that point, the miracles broke out. God moved and changed an impossible situation before their very eyes. And they didn't have to throw a single spear. They didn't have to fire a single arrow. God did all the heavy lifting, did all the fighting, and wiped them out. So the point is, is that God does things. He's already planned things um, in advance in your lives that you're not even aware of. I mean, for example, when we were down here uh, singing, Brian, you, were, uh, you led us into the song, Holiness beautiful psalm, I felt the presence of God very, very strongly just moving fully into the room. I and mean, it was very, to the degree of power that I was experienced of God coming into the sanctuary was uh, very surprising. I mean, it was, it's more than normal. It's not abnormal for people to feel the presence of God here. That's a normal thing around here at St. James. Um, and historically, it's been that way. Um, but, but this was something stronger. And so I just want you to know that as you were singing, God was already moving. See, when our praises go up, his presence and power comes down and fills the atmosphere. So the living God is here in our midst. And that's a good thing, right? Yeah, all right. Well, um, will you join me real quick in prayer? So Almighty God, we thank you, we praise your holy name, we worship you, we adore you, we honor you, and God, thank you for gifting us with the grace to love you as much as we are loved with the love that you first loved us with. And it is in your Son, the one who saves us, Christ Jesus, that we pray and we give you praise now and forever. Amen. So we've been in a sermon series about this is my body. And in week one, we talked about how God created us. Last week, we talked about marriage, how God married, you know, two people in the very beginning, setting the pattern for one man and one woman. Um, today, we're talking about how God protects us. And you see a situation like what has just blown up over in Ukraine, which I think is now day number 11 of the fighting. And, you know, sometimes you look at that and you think like, oh my gosh, God, what, what hope do the people have? Well, you and I need to understand something is that in the midst of war, God knows exactly when it will end and how it will end. Um, but when you look at it from a natural point of view, you know, you can think that it looks hopeless, but we've got to be careful because then that hopeless despair can rise and start to take over and, and program us as Christians in the wrong way so that we just simply give up. So as I shared here in the, in the town of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, um, things were really, really bad in the siege. I mean, they had already resorted to cannibalism by this point. And the scripture says, that's right, they were literally eating people. Um, and scripture says that um, in, the, in the reading here that a cup, and for those of you who cook, you know that a cup is not a lot, right? It's just a little bit. A cup of 
dove excrement, dove droppings, that does not sound appealing, does it? Um, it was selling for two ounces of silver. By the way, that is $50 in today's market. $50 they were paying for a cup of stuff from a dove. Horrible. Um, and, and how about the donkey? You know, if you go down to Kroger or Publix, if you say, I'd like to have a slab of donkey, you know, they're going to look at you like you're crazy, right? Because they don't serve donkey. Nobody wants to eat donkey. Never tried a donkey? I'm sure it's not very good. Um, but the worst part of a donkey um, would be the donkey's head, all right? Yet that was selling for, it said 34 ounces of silver. That is $850 in today's market for a donkey's head. See, that's how hungry, that's how famished, that's how desperate these people were back in this day. But I want you to see how God ended the war and when he ended the war. All right, so 2 Kings chapter 5 verse um, it's chapter 7, verse 5, and I'll read again through here like Garner did. So the diseased men, that's the lepers. So they got up right at the crack of dawn, and they decided to go to the, to the enemy camp because they felt like that's the only hope that we have. And when they came up there to the camp, what happened? Um, nobody was there, right? Everybody, the enemy soldiers had evacuated. They had, they had gone back home because the, the Lord had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a large army. And they just took off. So I love this. God created an illusion before them. Um, he, he completely, it was a sleight of hand. He tricked them so that they thought they heard something that didn't actually exist. And so they took off. So it was a very creative way that God just brought the war to a quick end. And also, you think about when he did it. He did it 24 hours after the prophet Elisha announced it. So they had been living in this place of hyperinflation because of the siege, and now all of a sudden, dramatically, I mean, just miraculously, the economy changed literally in one day so that things could become affordable again. So in what was a hopeless situation, God completely reversed what the natural outcome would have been. And that's what he does in your life. But you need to understand this. Sometimes God will let you get in situations that are completely hopeless to show you that he is your hope. Now, take courage because when Satan's attacks in your life are at their worst, that's when God's miracles are at their best. There's a guy by the name of Robbie Dawkins. He's a pastor from Illinois and a pretty inspiring guy, I tell you. Um, the Lord has used him to start this, this outreach to some of the most spiritually dark places on the planet, like over in the Middle East. And what he's setting up is like schools of evangelism, teaching the native people in those, in those nations um, teaching them about Christ, but then teaching them how to go and tell others about Christ. And so they're populating his presence and his ministry there is populating through these different areas like Afghanistan, like Iraq, like Syria, um, like Pakistan. So let's dial it back a few months. We know that last August and September, <clears throat> the American government had made the decision to get out of Afghanistan. So they were pulling out. Well, at that time, it was a very dangerous, dangerous moment for the Christians who were native to Afghanistan, those who had converted from, the, from Islam over to Christianity, following Jesus. So now the Taliban was coming into their country. Y'all remember that, right? I mean, it was just a few months ago. Um, and so um, 
Afghanistan, a lot of folks don't realize this, but Afghanistan has the second fastest growing church in the world. So Jesus' presence has been really strong and growing there. And the Afghans are coming to Christ. But the Taliban, when they came in, when our forces were pulling back, the Taliban rushed in and they were not being very hospitable toward the Afghan Christians, not surprisingly. And so they weren't letting them cross the border and get out of Afghanistan into other countries. So even Afghans who had a passport were basically, those passports were useless now. Taliban didn't care. They just weren't, weren't paying any attention to them. But the cool thing is, is that God started speaking to the Christians. And there were some, as they slept at night, they were given dreams by God about exactly where to pass along the border, where would be an open spot, and the exact time in which they needed to show up and cross the border so that the Taliban wouldn't see them. Some people were going up to the, the border, and, and God was saying in the moment, he was speaking, no, you need to go now into the other direction. And they would follow, and then they were able to get out. So God was taking some people out, but at the same time, he was asking some people to stay. In fact, there are, um, there are five leaders, pretty major leaders, of the underground Christian church in Afghanistan who chose to stay, and do you know why? They said, we want to bring Jesus to the Taliban. Isn't that awesome? Now you do know, right, that if you go and talk to the Taliban about Jesus, at that point, literally your head could fall off. That fast, literally. But yet they didn't care. In spite of the persecution that they were experiencing, um, God gave them this strong, unwavering faith. And so they were going to other Muslims. Again, last fall, and they're still doing this. They're going to Muslims saying, Hey, listen, don't return to Islam. Don't go back to the mosques. Jesus is the one that you need. And you think, how in the world do they have such fearlessness and courage? Well, what Robbie Dawkins said was, it kind of reminds us of a line from a Steve Camp song, which is this. One of the verses says, you don't know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. See, these people have nothing. A lot of them have no possessions, no homes. But they've got everything. Because they've got Christ in their life. They've got all of Jesus. So as God was doing his miracles back then and still is today, I'm confident he's doing them in Ukraine as well. I like what on Thursday we were having our prayer time for the Ukrainian people. And one of the people who joined us that that. Uh, Thursday afternoon was Kim Arnold, a member of our church. And so toward the end, we were just kind of talking about the way things are right now and how the you know, Russian army is just moving and, and continuing to gain traction against uh, the land of Ukraine. And um, Kim said, we know who wins in the end, right? Because you can look at that and you can think like, oh, goodness, Lord, I mean, this is, this is discouraging because more people, a million and a half, have had to leave. But she said, we know who wins in the end. And that reminded me of something that Adrian Rogers, who's a, a pastor from long ago, he used to teach about, I um, mean, he's gone to heaven now, but he used to say, we don't pray for victory. So when you're looking at a situation like that, Lord, you're not praying, give them a win. You don't pray for victory, you pray from victory. Okay, because Jesus has already done the work. So Elisha, in that same chapter, chapter 6, a little bit earlier, um, Elisha is in another uh, troubling situation, which has nothing to do with this one. This is, this is different, and he's over in, I think, a town called Dothan. But he's in a, in a different city at this point, and, um, and he is surrounded by a military that's been sent to kill him. And this man was always under the threat of death. 
Um, and, and so he was surrounded. And Elijah's servant, guy who worked for him on his payroll, was uh, freaking out at this point. He was really, really nervous. And so Elisha prayed to the Lord, and he said, Lord, he said, would you open his eyes so that he can see? Let him see. And then all of a sudden, this man was able to see um, there were angels all over the hilltops that God had positioned there to strike at the right time against the enemy forces. So what Elisha knew is what we know, is that greater is he who is with us than the evil one in the world. And so when you and I pray, we need to understand God asks you not to pray um, optimistically, not to pray pessimistically, but to pray realistically. And here's how you inject realism into your prayers. Remember Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Right now, what the scripture teaches us is that you are in two places at the same time. Okay, now, you're planted in the pews in Athens, Georgia. All right, okay? I haven't lost my mind. All right, so you're here. We get that. Our feet are on earth. But you are literally in heaven too. Because the Holy Spirit who's in you is also in Jesus and he's everywhere. And he is taking you um, so that you are literally in heaven with Jesus sitting beside him from the throne. So that is your place. That is our place of victory. So from that, we understand where we are, and it gives us resurrection eyes from which to realistically pray about these situations where we think like, okay, this is only going to end in defeat for me or for them. And so we know that what Ephesians 1.19 says is true, is that as you're praying, incomparably great power has been given to you in your prayers in your life. And I like what Jesus said, don't forget. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. His words, not mine. I hope you realize Satan does not have one ounce of authority over your life. Not one. Now he used to. He used to own you before you met Jesus. But on that day, everything flipped. It changed. And so you were taught, you were taken from a losing situation into a winning situation because you're on the king's side and the king doesn't lose. So in your prayers, the way that you and I are to pray is, is that we must pray understanding reality is that Jesus has moved you from defense to offense, so you pray offensively in your prayers against impossible situations and against the evil one. And Jesus, and actually the scriptures are not wrong from Romans 6, 16, 20, when, when uh, Paul wrote, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Your feet. So you are living right now on a spiritual battlefield. Go out there uh, walking into that battlefield with your feet of prayers and keep releasing them, keep releasing them and start to pray the things that God has already promised. So here's how you pray from victory rather than for victory. Here's how you do it. I'm going to give you a, just a quick example of this. One, let's say that you're praying for the people in Ukraine right now, all right? Um, and I'm confident that God is responding to all these prayers that have already been lifted up. Okay, so let's look at what God has promised. Because what God has promised, he's going to act on. Okay, you can guarantee that always. Um, because God gives his word and he keeps his word. So Psalm 29, 11, it says, The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. So what you'd do is, you'd say, okay, Lord, for people who have been sleep-deprived for the last 72 hours, 
because the bombs are going off. God, would you, um, would you give them the strength so they feel like they have just woken up? Would you give them power, God, so they feel like an 18-year-old again? God, would you give them amazing supernatural strength like you gave to Samson? And would you, in the midst of a terrifying situation, would you give them your peace? And guess what? God will do it because he says so, right? Isaiah 58, 11 through 12, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land or or, or bomb-riddled um, um, territory. He will satisfy your needs there and will strengthen your frame. So you pray that, okay, God, I thank you that you're guiding the Ukrainian people now. Guide them, God, specifically about how to get out from Kiev or Maripool or wherever, whatever city they're in and get them out, God, safely over into Moldova or Belarus or any of these other countries. Guide them, God, because you've promised that, and he will do that. 2 Thessalonians, one last one, chapter 3, verse 3. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So we would pray, God, thank you that you're not going to give these people into Satan's hands. Thank you, God, that you're already scattering the seeds of revival in that country so they will be strong in Jesus right now. Thank you, God. Remember what Kim said, we know who wins in the end. So don't ask God for a win. Pray from what he's already won. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's kids said, amen. All right, now would you join me um, in prayer? So Almighty God, I give you worship. We give you praise. And we thank you, God. I pray, Lord, for faith, for faith that is so strong, for faith that believes through impossibilities on earth that when normally, Lord, um, convince us otherwise, that, God, literally nothing is impossible for you. But, Lord, help us to pray with you, Jesus, on the throne. Help us to pray like you pray. Because you never pray from a place of despair or hopelessness. Because you're the God of hope. So help us, Lord, to pray, um, God, in ways that just match the way that you pray to the Father. Almighty God, we're grateful that you keep us close to your heart. Because we know that, Lord, our tendency is, is that we make idols. We have other substitutes for you without even realizing it. We're not even trying. And so, Lord, I pray right now that as we take communion this morning, that you would pull us and you would draw us and you would keep us close, close, closer to your heart. So, God, I pray right now that you would come and do some house cleaning in our hearts. Because what Garner prayed is, is spot on. You don't want us to simply change our behaviors. You want a whole change of our heart. Because when you change all of our heart, then all of our behaviors will follow in a good way. So come and do that now, Lord. Forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for ways that we have just callously, arrogantly, or even forgottenly, just broken your commands without even thinking about it, without even really caring about it. Forgive us. Oh God, forgive us, we ask now. Just lift up anything you've done wrong now to God. Let Jesus cover that now with his blood. And as he does so, feel him take that from you and release you into his forgiving mercy and his peace. 
And Father, would you pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on this bread and the juice. Make these become for us the body and the blood of Christ so that as we take them, God, we are supernaturally bound to Jesus in a tremendously close way. We come closer to each other, Lord, um, and that we minister heart with heart, hand in hand, to the Five Points area and way throughout Athens with every breath that we breathe. Because, God, you did not put us on this earth so that other people would serve us. You put us to serve them. So thank you, God. And until that day, Father, when you send your Son back for us and he puts us in the new heaven on the new earth, all honor, Father, all glory, Father, all, um, all majesty belongs to you this day and forevermore. Amen.